Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the uh, New Technologies in Mathematics seminar of the uh, CMSA at Harvard University. And uh, today we are delighted to have uh, Stephen Skeena from the uh, Department of uh, Computer Science at uh, Stony Brook University. And uh, Steve is also the director of the uh, AI Institute at uh, Stony Brook University. So he has many contributions in uh, data science and uh, many areas of, compu of, of, of computing and in particular in this area of uh, graph embeddings. And uh, we'll hear about that today. Uh, Steve. Okay, thank you, uh, Mike. Um... Let me start by saying first, uh oh, let's see if this is going to work. Okay, good. So, first, I thank you for the invitation. Um, and that said, I'll just quickly say that I've been dreading this more than, you know, just about any presentation I've given recently. And, and the reason, let me explain why, and then uh, we'll, we'll go through this. You know, first, I gave a talk on embeddings, graph embeddings, at a workshop uh, up up your your way uh, back in January of 2019. So some of uh, a, lo a lot of the material here is uh, you know sort of older stuff that we've done in uh, graph embeddings. So we talked about that there, um, and uh, of course, you guys know a lot about graph embeddings because you've had a bunch of different talks there. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to talk about some of the old stuff that we've done, just to give you uh, a background for the story that I'd like to tell about some new stuff, okay? And the new stuff is a little rougher than, uh, than I normally like to talk about, but that might mean that there's questions, things to talk, things to talk about, some issues that, that uh, may, may inspire some questions or may inspire some further, further work. Okay, so let me just see how I get this to go. Hold on. I am having trouble getting this to, okay, Bing, I see now. Let me go back, sorry about that. Okay, bingo. So uh, I'll be talking in here a lot about word embeddings. What are word embeddings? As far as I'm concerned, word embeddings are, again, a way, how do you represent what the meaning of a word is? Um, you can think of several different representations like definitions or images or some logical structure. But what we're going to be talking about to, uh, for this talk are these kind of latent representations, the bar on the bottom. Um, and that's kind of representing what the word cat means as kind of a vector of numbers. You can imagine the negative numbers are red, the, the positive numbers are blue. And um, thus every the meaning of each word becomes a point in um, you know some, some latent space, you know, 100 dimensions, 200 dimensions. And um, the you know, basic goal is we would like to try to construct a concise um, you know, representation of what words mean so that we can build models from them. Uh, hold on a second. And I'm having, ah, bingo. And so how do we train these kind of models? Well, um, there are, again, when you're trying to train uh, or, or learn something, you need to have kind of some kind of ground truth to work with. Um, what I think the clever idea behind word embeddings was this idea that you could take large amounts of real text, you know, good text from the web or any other training area. Um, if you randomly change one of the words in, in, any, in any piece of text, likely you're gonna corrupt the phrase. So it may not be a valid sentence in English or valid phrase in English or whatever language you're building it. If you can build a model that would um, be able to tell the difference between original phrases and corrupted phrases, then you will uh, have to know something about what those words mean. And so uh, there's a famous program called word to vec that basically builds a model to distinguish, you know, essentially distinguish broken phrases from true phrases. Okay, and along the way trains a representation of what the words mean. And when you look at these things, again, I think of these words as being represented as points in space, okay? Um, and even visually, when you look at it like this, you know, you can tell that um, words that are animals look the same. Words that are colors, colors look the same. Numbers look the same. Somehow this training, in, in, you know, uh, gives us a point representation of what the word means. That, uh, you know, that if we take it over an entire language, 
we can have, you know, kind of this, this entire constellation of what all the words in, link, in English sort of mean, okay, and how they, you know, and implicitly by their position, how they relate to each other. Um, and again, you can do these things in any language, okay, not just, obviously not just English, on any, you know, on any sequence, training on any sequence of tokens. Um, but again, word embeddings were originally very useful in um, natural language processing. We got originally involved with word embeddings because we wanted to be able to build a system for doing basic NLP in, lot, in you know, 100 languages and um, doing things like entity recognition and part of speech analysis and things like that. And um, basically, word embeddings trained over different Wikipedia editions enabled us to build such models. So what I, that's sort of why word embeddings uh, exist and are important. What I'd like to talk about is some work uh, that is uh, kind of about using word embeddings for things other than you know, really natural language processing and some of the ideas in, uh, in that. And we've worked on a bunch of things over the years. Then, you know, I'm gonna talk a, about, uh, you know, identifying changes in meaning. I'm gonna then talk about uh, some of our work in graph embeddings. Uh, and um, the more recent work we were working on are things like the, on embeddings for dynamic graphs and trying to think about whether graph embeddings or word embeddings tell us something about how people generate knowledge or what people find interesting. And that those are kind of the uh, newer work that I'm gonna to try to talk about in here. Um, okay, so what are we interested in when we want to know about uh, language? We know that word embeddings capture what languages mean, um, but one thing that's interesting is that the meaning of words change with time, okay? That uh, there are words like, uh, you know, that, 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 that change their meaning. Um, the word gay in my lifetime changed from the primary sense of the word being happy to the primary sense of the word dealing with homosexual and, 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 and stuff like that. So um, the question is, is there a way that we can analyze text corpus and figure out which words are changing their meaning, okay, in, a, in an interesting way? And word embeddings provides us a way to do this because word embeddings, the kind of I can kind of think of each word as having a meaning as a point that, you know, its meaning is in some sense described or it's part of its usage, it's part of speech. So all that kind of stuff is kind of captured in, you know, as, as a, a point in hundred dimensional space. As a word changes, that point in some sense should move through space. And so we can, you know, track words and figure out which ones move in interesting ways. Um, and so we built in a project where we, you know, took a look at uh, Google's um, Google's books, book engrams project. Tells basically collects all the text from scan books that Google has scanned from books that were, um, you know, published in certain time windows. And by breaking this down into five-year time windows, we can train a, a word embedding on books from 1900, a book from 1905, books from 1910, okay? And then we have to do some kind of warping in order to take these latent spaces and bring them into the same space, okay? And we can do that using linear regression. And then we can look at, again, some kind of measure of how much do points move, okay? Again, the technically interesting thing here is really the fact that the embeddings you know, independently trained embeddings may represent the same thing, but uh, but the, you know, the the dimensions of the space uh, don't have the same meaning. But by doing you know some linear using linear regression to rotate one of the spaces to the other, we can make the representations trained on one corpus, um, you know, consistent with the representation in another corpus. You can do the same thing. Uh, if you have equivalences between languages, you could take a Spanish word embedding and kind of map it to the English space, okay? If you have the appropriate anchors to work on that with. 
But um, when we did this analysis, we were able to discover which words moved the most, okay? And again, gay is a word that uh, over, um, you know, that, and, and we, you know, we had a statistical method to assign a p-value to these things. Um, gay was an example of a word that moved, moved um, you know, quite a bit, and we can date kind of when the transition sort of happened. Um, my favorite uh, of the words that changed meaning was diet. Diet was one that at one point meant what you ate, okay? And then at some point, diet meant what you didn't eat, okay? So you kind of went on a diet instead of, you know, and, and so the sense kind of changed. And anyway, so this was an interesting case where we could use word embeddings to um, figure out something about uh, how, how uh, language evolves. And again, we're we interested in other things you can kind of do with word embeddings. Um, we'd like to be able to, word embeddings are just points in space, but we would like to try to build other structures on top of these word embeddings. Um, ideally, we would like to maybe come up with some kind of a, you know, a tree or an arborescence, okay, that would um, kind of let us construct some kind of a hierarchy from maybe most general to le less general. You know, banana and fruit probably have similar word embeddings, but um, but somehow banana is a fruit and fruit isn't a banana. And um, so we've we've de we've developed some methods for for building these kind of structures on tops of word embeddings based on observations that um, you know that that frequency of words often captures a notion of generality. Okay, and when you 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 use frequency and positional differences, you can generate interesting um, structures here. So, okay, so that's what I think I wanna talk about, uh, at least for now on word embeddings. Um, one of the things that we did to generalize beyond word embeddings was um, we wanted to try to generalize this to, to graphs. Um, and again, you have kind of a problem where uh, if you are Mark Zuckerberg, who want, has a, access to a giant network, a giant social network, okay, and you want to show ads to these people, you want to try to find a way to take the connectivity pattern, okay, of for each person who they're connected to, and boil this down to a concise vector, repre rep 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 vector representation that you can use to train models. Okay, and um, so these are kind of what what we call graph embeddings. We can, I think of them as no. You could think of them as node embedding. We're interested in a representation of what each vertex in the graph is. Um, and our deep work technique is, you know, uh, you know, has properties that it's actually relatively scalable. You don't need the whole graph. Um, you know, uh, it's reasonably efficient, although uh, still has a problem. And it, 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 the idea is very, you know, incredibly simple. Um, basically, if you think about a random walk in a graph, a random walk in a graph could be interpreted as being, you know, it is a sequence of vertices. If you think of the vertices of a graph as a vocabulary and um, these random walk sequences, as being um, sentences, you can now use all the machinery from word embeddings and take these random walks and just simply use them to um, try to come up with, you know, to develop a embedding for each vertex. And these, um, what you call it, this this method, you know, works works quite well. That uh, that using these um, what these uh, the resulting vert graph embeddings, vertex embeddings that we build, end up producing very good model, good feature feature vectors for machine learning models. Um, and again, the property that we add that was good about this is that they produce good models, good features. Other um, techniques like spectral methods are difficult to use on very large graphs. Because you know, just because of the you know the the, the space and the, uh, the the computational complexity, but to a certain extent, with these kind of methods, you can use as many walks as you're willing to to build, okay? And so it's fairly scalable. 
And the deep walk method we built became, has become, you know, to my mind, amazingly popular. Um, again, our paper has had, you know, getting close to 5,000 citations now. And um, kind of has been the, uh, the, you know, found, you know, anyway, these embeddings that we produce, I find very, very satisfying. And um, just as an example of something where we use the, um, the, this, these kind of graph embeddings uh, to develop maybe a little intuition about them. Here was uh, what happens when you deep walk Belgium. We had a collaborator who had access to the um, telephone call graph of Belgium, or at least one of the major phone companies in Belgium. And uh, you know they, they knew which person called which other person based just on the, um, what you call it, the, uh, the, you know, the, the connectivity here, we could build a feature representation now, one of the things that's interesting about Belgium is that, that the country is largely divided between two languages, okay? And that the telephone provider gave people the choice of whether they would want their messages in French, Flemish, German, or English. When you take the embedding, project it down to two dimensions, and you see the, um, what you call it, the, uh, and you color them by what language they speak. It's amazing, I mean, I find it amazing how, how well this reconstructs the language structure in Belgium, okay? Just based on, you know, the connectivity patterns. And, um, you know, again, there's all kinds, I, I, you can do other things. If you train, do a deep walk of um, build embeddings on Wikipedia, all the people in Wikipedia, the nearest neighbor for a Beethoven are gonna be composers. The nearest neighbors for Mick Jagger will all be rock stars, okay? Um, Albert Einstein will have physicists as neighbors, okay? So the point I guess that I wanna emphasize is that, that these methods seem to produce very nice um, coherent spaces that seem to capture a lot of what we think of as the structure of what these, uh, you know, how, how language is organized and how, um, you know, these networks are organized. Um, over the, 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 you know, in the subsequent years, we developed various other graph embedding algorithms. Um, one that, uh, that was, that, that uh, what we, was, we like a little, like was um, a technique that would try to build a hierarchical embedding. Again, if you think about the problem of, draw, of embedding graphs to build feature vectors, um, another world where people kind of embed graphs is in the graph drawing community. There's people who build systems for given a network, how do you lay it out so people can look at it? And these methods are typically hierarchical. They try to break the graph into clusters or into a coarser version, lay out the, you know, coarse version, okay, to give the gross structure of what they're doing. And then add back, you know, expand the clusters and put them in the right place. And um, we developed an embedding technique called HARP that kind of does this. That has the property that if you apply this on top of, you know, the other standard um, graph embedding techniques, you can produce somewhat better, um, you know, certainly better looking embeddings, but also ones that, that do a little bit better on. Uh, you know, certain classification tasks. That said, um, you know, again, the deep walk technique, I have, I've always been, you know, kind of amazed by how, how well it kind of worked. And again, and this is a, a, a quote from a paper I like, because it tells us that, you know, even though deep walk was really one of the first of these graph embedding methods, okay, on, um, you know, many classification tasks. It doesn't work quite as well on link prediction, but, it, but for, for classification tasks, it tends to work um, quite competitively, okay, or better than many methods, even methods that, that came later then. And of course, um, we, since, uh, you know, um, more recently, graph convolutional networks and, gra you know, gra graph neural networks have kind of become popular. And these have 
in some ways two different advantages over the graph embeddings that we that that, that like deep walk first they 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 they're trained in a supervised manner and so they can take advantage if you have labels or properties of the graph in some sense you could build of the nodes or the edges you can kind of build that into the embedding okay Again, if you or or you could build a model where you treat those things as separate features later, but GCNs give you a way to keep that involved, and they also make it uh, easy to add uh, impute embeddings for new vertices after training. Okay, and whereas DeepWalk kind of assumes the full graph. Um, that said, I I find having embeddings are, you know, as kind of interesting objects. If you think of them as objects you get to ask a different set of questions. And that's kind of what uh, I think is gonna inspire some of the stuff a little bit later. Okay. Um, another direction that we've worked in to try to build um, embeddings is to look at random projections. Um, you know, that again, DeepWalk was, has been you know, proven quite popular and it is not slow as graph embedding methods go. But if you're working on really large graphs, it is still an expensive operation. You know, when we use a million node graph, you know, my students would complain it would take 30 CPU days to embed a million node graph. And uh, of course, you know, because you can, you know, do this in parallel, it's not 30 real days, but still it's a uh, expensive thing. So we've been very interested in methods that are, you know, for try faster embeddings. And um, one class of methods that, that are interesting are these random projection methods. That if you take um, the an row of an adjacency matrix and you do a dot product with a random vector, okay, two adjacency matrix rows that are very similar will produce a similar dot product with that same random vector. Whereas if you have a random vector that a, 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 a matrix that with, with different connectivity, it will produce a different number. So if you, you could use this kind of technique to build um, embeddings, okay? There's a whole theory of random projections that is interesting. Um, one thing that's, that's, that one of the things that gives deep walk its kind of power is this, um, the fact that instead of just dealing with an adjacency matrix, we are, uh, what you call it, we, we, by taking walks, we're in some sense considering longer paths, which are analogous to kind of squaring the matrix or cubing the matrix. A path three length can kind of be computed by cubing the adjacency, you know, sort of shows up as, you know, in, the, in a cube of the adjacency matrix. Um, the trouble is, doing a square of a large matrix is extremely expensive, okay? But by using associativity, you can basically compute uh, the projection of the square of a matrix without taking N by N time. It's N by the number of, by D, the number of dimensions, okay? And so, uh, so these projections can be made to capture that. And if you use the right normalization techniques, I don't want to go through the detail, but I mean, if you use the right normalization techniques to, um, uh, you know, basically bring the, the different powers into uh, alignment, okay, you can end up with, with actually quite good embeddings very, very quickly. So um, if we look at, at this slide, um, this is a, the, these three figures here represent embeddings of, um, what you call it, the uh, embeddings of a graph, part of the uh, inter, part of the web, um, and we their vertices websites are colored by the domain, the you know the last two di two digit extension of their domain, so that uh, the UK sites and the Japanese sites and the, you expect these to show considerable clustering by nation. Deepwalks embedding looks nice and clustered. Um, the one on the right, RandNE, is a competitor's um, random projection method, okay? And this, as you can see, you don't see anywhere near as nice coherences with DeepWalk. FastRP is the method that we have, and I think you see it looks a lot more coherent, okay? And these random projection embeddings are just amazingly faster to generate. 
they're not, I don't think they're quite as, they're not quite as good as, you know, deep walk and, and similar kind of methods, but they are thousands of times faster on large graphs. And that makes a difference, okay? In fact, one question we were kind of curious about more recently was um, the question of whether you could construct word embeddings fast by using the same technology as graph embeddings. Remember, we, with DeepWalk, you're kind of using word embeddings to construct graph embeddings. Is there a way we can use graph embeddings to construct word embeddings? Well, these random projection methods kind of work on matrices, you know, the adjacency matrix, or in a case of graphs, you can imagine a word co-occurrence matrix, okay? And um, you can now try to uh, think about taking, building a word co-occurrence matrix. How often is one wor is word I close to word J, maybe next to it or in a, a small window in the text, okay? And then do a random projection on these things down. Um, again, when you compare this to standard graph embedding methods like fast, like, like Glove, which is a uh, another popular word embedding method, okay, this can be uh, hundreds of times faster, okay. Um, but on our experiments, we we don't quite produce as as good um, embeddings. Um, Actually, on this test, maybe it's worth looking at the, the numbers a little bit here. Here, um, what is this? What are the graphs here showing? We have four data sets about um, word similarity. How much are that where they've asked people for these pair of words, give me a, you know, a, a human annotators. How similar are these words? Okay. How similar is the association between love and sex or sun and sunlight? Okay, or old and new, okay? And um, basically what we were trying to do here was to try to build models that would, would predict this similarity, this observed similarity from our embeddings. And um, the one on the right shows what happens when we train um, an embedding on glove, okay? Uh, using the glove technique, which is, again, gloves are a very good set of embeddings, okay? Um, and on the right is what happens when we when we try to build models like this in um, what you call it uh, on small chunks of the um, what you call it uh, you know using a random projection method okay and again they, it doesn't do terrible but it doesn't do as good as as the original embedding unfortunately okay. What I'd like to now talk about is, again, I'm kind of interested in these fast embeddings, what one can build from these. Um, and I'd like to harken back to what I was talk to the, when I was talking about how words evolve. Um, remember we had this, I was talking about um, how uh, words, you know, the, the, how, how we can look at word embeddings and by training them on, text from different periods of time, come up with meaning of what a uh, the word is and how the meaning of the word changes over time. With dynamic graph embedding, I would like to do in some sense a similar thing with a graph, okay? My claim would be that many, many graphs evolve over time, okay? If you think about a social network, certainly, um, you make friends, you lose friends, okay? When you move someplace, you make a different set of friends. Um, we would like to build a, uh, a way of capturing um, what is the changing meaning of a, a, a graph, of, of a vertex in a graph, okay? And um, so this gets us into the notion of dynamic graph embeddings. And, you know, one standard way to do it is, you know, probably something that's maybe analogous to what we did with the text situation. If you took the edges that were present, you know, maybe you, you take your period of time and you um, slice the network into pieces, okay? Maybe all the edges from, you know, from 19, 1997, then all the edges from 1998, 1999, okay? You could build a sequence of graphs, 
Okay, and so one way to do a dynamic graph embedding would be to time slice the graph and train independent embeddings on it. Um, but this isn't quite what we really want to do. Um, we'd like to be able to have something that's kind of an online world where we are, um, you know, kind of monitoring the nodes as we, you know, as they as they change through time. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and ideally look at how things have been moving recently to try to, in an online fashion, predict whether or not um, nodes are, are changing their meaning. Um, now, the trouble is training graph embeddings is an expensive thing on a large graph. Again, typically we're interested in looking at Wikipedia. Um, what we would like to be able to do is something like in this figure about uh, Trump and Biden. The x-axis for that graph is year of Wikipedia. And the y-axis is kind of a measure of, according to our embedding method, how much did, um, you know, did the representation of either Trump or Biden change, at, you know, during the, uh, you know, in, in, in a recent interval? And if you look at something like this, if you look at the Trump line, you'll see Trump's line life was pretty much steady until about mid of 2015, when suddenly he went through an enormous change as he went from being, you know, a TV and real estate figure to a politician. And his representation changed a lot until after he got to be president for a while. And then life didn't change very much. Okay, that's why that line goes back down. When we look at Biden, Joe Biden, again, Joe Biden's life changed a little bit during the time when he was being reelected as vice president. Okay, but then basically his life was pretty unstable up until the time that uh, he, you know, he, he seriously became the nominee and became the president and there were a lot of new things he was exposed to. We would like to be able to produce graphs that look like this. The input is a network that's changing over time. The output is we would like to uh, be able to see how are, is it, what, when are nodes changing in what they mean, okay? And we'd like to do this over all of Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is large. And um, if you have to train on the entire network, Okay, trying to keep track of every edge or giving up a new embedding after every month or every short interval. This is expensive. Instead, what we were interested in was, was learning, can we take all of Wikipedia, but learn, say we have a small number of nodes that we really care about. Can we track to see how they change over time? That's kind of what we mean by sub subset node representation learning. And, and to do this, we have a, uh, a, a method uh, called dynamic PPE, okay, that we've recently developed that kind of has worked on that, that tries to build embeddings based on the idea of personalized page rank. Page rank is, um, you know, again, and is, is a famous algorithm that's kind of associated with Google that kind of builds a node centrality for every node in the network, okay? It tries to um, get the sense of what is the probability that if you did a random walk on this network, okay? What is the probability you'd land at each node? That'll tell you which nodes are more important than uh, more central than other ones. In personalized page rank, we're interested in starting from one node and want to know what are the nodes around it that are kind of important. And basically, uh, it, it computes it by doing random walks starting from the node in question. But with a certain probability and a certain frequency, it jumps back to the node in question. So you're not going to take long walks around the graph. You're going to take walks that are basically exploring the neighborhood of nodes around the graph. Okay, and by doing one of these personalized page rank computations, 
you can find out what um, basically build a vector for any vertex. It will build a vector of for all vertices that have been reached on these walks, what's the probability I will end up at those nodes? Okay. Now, there are faster ways to compute this, um, you know, this, uh, you know, personalized page rank than um, what you call then then explicitly doing the random walks by appropriately building probabilities and pushing the numbers around. Um, but we are interested in computing not only the page rank, the, 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 if we're gonna build an embedding around this page rank, personalized page rank idea, we would like to be able to update it by adding edges and seeing how that adjusts when we insert another edge, a link between two things. How does that change the personalized page rank? So there's a method for, you know, um, adjusting these probabilities that was developed by Zhang, okay? And basically um, our, you know, proposal for how you could build these dynamic embeddings would be that again, we, 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 we try to build a personalized page rank representation of the vertices we care about, okay? We can take this vector and basically project that down, perhaps by dot products with other with a random vector, to build an embedding of a hundred dimensions or something like that. Okay, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to look at the graph in incrementally, add edges, adjust the page rank computations, and then project them. Okay, and if we do that, we end up getting. Um, reasonably good um, embeddings for, uh, for, you know, for, for things as a function of time. So what's this graph? Again, the x-axis here is the time in Wikipedia. The, um, the uh, y-axis is the, um, the accuracy as measured by some form of F1 score. Okay, I have a bunch of different methods where we are training on Wikipedia starting from 2001 and going through time, and then trying to predict what label would it have, okay, in the year 2020, okay? So some of that information is available. Sometimes that label can be tell, told as early as 2001, 2002, but, um, but obviously, you know, things may change roles, you know, uh, the role that is important may not be clear at that at, at the end. Bottom line, this dynamic PPE does better at building one of these dynamic em, uh, embeddings than the, the random NE method that we talked about. That would also be fast for building dynamic embeddings. Okay. But um, but uh, this has the property and, and and some other incremental heuristics that we've looked at. Okay then this gives us a way to, to plot a representation that changes over time. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, let me move on. Then the final kind of topic I, I, uh, I, I'd like to talk about uh, is uh, an, uh, a question that I kind of raised at the, the meeting I was up at Harvard um, in 2019. Um, I flashed up this slide where I was kind of curious about, we know that um, what do, again, I think of embeddings as being either a word embedding or a graph embedding can be kind of thought of as a constellation of star, you know, constellation of points in space. Um, where there is some kind of clustering structure on them. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, and the thing in the center, if you may remember, that's, that represents English and that's the word embeddings of English and the colors are from parts of speech or something like that. Um, and the question that I guess I was interested in was, could we make, say something sensible about how embeddings um, should look 
Okay, why is it that embeddings look the way they do? Um, or more specifically, um, you know, if you think about languages and you think about Wikipedia, these are human generated structures, okay? I mean, people write Wikipedia about things that they are interested in. Every page is something that people are interested in. The reason you have words in a language vocabulary is, is there's a concept that people are interested in. And when I think about word and graph embeddings, again, I find that these nearest neighbor structures in these embeddings are very, very compelling, okay? I think of these word and graph embeddings as kind of providing a geometric representation of human generated structures, things like Wikipedia topics and the language vocabularies. And I kind of ask kind of, a, 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 what I think is kind of a big picture question. If these embeddings really kind of capture what these things mean, okay? And if, um, you know, uh, these, these, uh, the these structures are human struct constructed structures. Is there something that the the organization of these embeddings tells us something about how people what people find interesting, how people generate new knowledge and new concepts? Where do new words come from? Why is a new word coined? Okay, um, and you could imagine a lot of different um, kind of models. Just, you know, if you want to just think in your head about this, there might be different kind of models you can generate, okay, that might try to say, why is it that point embedding spaces look like they do, okay? Perhaps em embedding spaces are point samples from a Gaussian distribution randomly, okay? Perhaps there are some form of preferential attachment or preferential placement models. Okay, that that new entities are kind of associated, come into being with, you know, uh, connected to old embed, old concepts. Okay, and they're more likely to go connected to to big important concepts than than less frequent concepts. Okay, we could think about similar kind of models, not the preferential attachment models are on graphs. You can think of similar kinds of models in point sets, okay, and, and uh, preferential placement models. New concept points are stuck in space, okay, based on where they are. You can think about gravitational attraction models. Maybe entities are kind of these, these masses in space and that Trump is this big gaseous giant and, this, and the gravitational force of him attracts other things, okay? Maybe there's kind of like concepts emerge at the boundaries of other concepts between two or three other concepts. What I would like to think that the, the, the question that I would like to think about is, can, you, um, can we think about different models that might generate embedding like things, okay? And then evaluate to what extent they are, um, you know, evaluate to what extent embeddings from real data sets look like them. Okay. Can we, and that's kind of really what, what, what this part of the talk is now going to be about. Is there a way that I can kind of evaluate uh, whether an existing embedding, okay, a Wikipedia embedding or word embedding, okay, has properties consistent with some kind of a generative model? Okay, and so we need to have statistics. So we've developed two kinds of statistics to measure kind of properties that I would like to um, think would shed light on how embeddings may be organized. Okay, and um, I find that it's easier to think about this visually. The first question is gonna be, if you have an entity, how, what is the magnitude or the importance or the significance of the, the, the near neighbors around you, okay? And so the figure that, um, 
that I'm looking at here on the left, okay? If I look at the left in Wikipedia, you'll see a cumulative histogram on the uh, second from the left, okay? This is supposed to look at the immediate neighborhood of Copernicus. Copernicus was, you know, the guy who, did, you know, decided that the sun was in the center of the solar system. Um, what do we know? If we look at the neighbors of Copernicus, okay? In fact, the 10 nearest neighbors of Copernicus, who's a very important guy, turn out to be pretty important guys. And so there is a histogram here where the x-axis is the rank of all your um, your entities from least important to most important. And the, the y-axis is a cumulative thing about um, what you call it, about uh, how often, um, you know, what you call, of, of, of what fraction of your neighborhood have you covered? And the area under this cumulative distribution gives you a measure of how important you are, your neighborhood is, okay? And um, you can do a similar thing with, um, with words. Words like red, which have, is, a, is a popular word. Um, are the neighbors of the word red relatively popular words? The area under this, this, this curve should be one if its neighbors are the most, possible, most important possible words, okay? The neighborhood area would be near zero if they were the least important possible things. And you can look like a relatively rare word like prolix, okay? The area under that is less, okay? Um, so what is the observation here? The observation I guess I'd like to make is that when you look at word embeddings, okay, um, and graph embeddings, you end up getting a, a, a plot that looks something like this, okay? You're gonna want, look at the left figure in each batch. You will see that for the low ranked words uh, or, or the low ranked entities, these are the ones that are most important, okay? The area under their, you know, uh, of their neighborhood, okay, is high, meaning that as you go from high frequency or, or high uh, degree Wikipedia nodes, okay, the lower ones, when you look at their embeddings, okay, you'll see that, that, that less important words and, and entities ha generally have less important neighborhoods. That's kind of the view here. And um, they, again, they're, they're, if we, we look at the same thing in Wikipedia, okay, that again, you get a similar kind of thing. That when you take Wikipedia's graph and you deep walk it, okay, you get a graph embedding. Again, the neighborhoods of more popular entities have a, a more important entities, more low degree and high degree entities have higher degree. Now, there's some question of why these things emerge in word embeddings, which I'm not, I think I'm gonna skip because I can see I'm running a little low in time. But now we can ask ourselves what models kind of generate behavior like this. If you have points that are distributed, you know, here we have the points distributed in a hundred dimensional Gaussian distribution. Okay, and we give them arbitrary importance, random, you know, assigned importance randomly. There's, as you would expect, no structure based on the neighborhood, okay? That every point, no matter whether you were uh, considered important or not important, your neighborhood, you know, there's no uh, frequency, no difference there. Now we can look at other models for trying to build, um, you know, networks, okay? And again, these preferential attachment models are very, very popular. The barbassi albert model builds scale-free graphs by taking um, nodes, taking, uh, you know, inserting new nodes into a graph by basically connecting it to M other nodes that are already there. And it selects these nodes based proportional to their degree. So if you are a high degree node, you're more likely to be uh, the other endpoint of one of the uh, of a new, newly inserted node, and the richer get richer. If you're high degree, you're likely to have your degree increased a lot. 
And this is a very popular model for, um, you know, again, explaining things like power law um, behavior. And if we take a network like that, we can use deep walk and embed it and give us points in space. When we look at these, this model, it doesn't have the same property. Okay, when you take these Barbasi Albert graphs and you embed them, okay, and in fact, is the opposite. The poor have richer neighborhoods. Why is that? Because they're being, by definition, newly inserted nodes are more likely to be connected to very, very big things. Big nodes are likely to be connected to very, very poor things. Okay, so this model doesn't generate that kind of behavior. Um, with, with, with Sergei Veruchik uh, at, at, at CSMA, okay, we started looking at um, preferential placement processes, okay? Could we generate new nodes and certain new nodes into space by selecting um, nodes according to their frequency? Okay, so we generate a power law frequency and place them kind of new nodes in distance based on where the last sample was, okay? This model also does not reproduce the kind of neighborhood structure that you're kind of seeing here. Um, we played a little bit with gravitational attraction models. What happens if you assign a weight distribution, okay? A, a, you know, each concept gets a weight according to perhaps, a, you know, one of these power laws. And then you must do a, uh, an end body simulation and big entities tend to attract other entities towards it. This model seems to be, reconstruct the behavior we see that, 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 that the bigger objects tend to have bigger neighborhoods than, um, than, than, or, you know, more, larger and more important entities in its neighborhood, as opposed to sort of lesser entities. And that's kind of the behavior we saw and observed in our embeddings. We're also interested in one other property, if we want to observe these things, um, that, you know, kind of, you would expect that embeddings are kind of organized in clusters on some way and subclusters that uh, you've got politicians and within politicians, maybe you've got American politicians and you've got you know, European politicians. You can imagine subclusters. And the question of what is the organization of these clusters? And so here we're, we're thinking about this where, what happens if we start out with a world where all the nodes are independent and we gradually add the shortest edge, okay? We, we take all the edges, the distances between pairs of nodes and add edges from shortest to longest, okay? And if you look at this, you would expect that based on whatever model you generate of how these graphs come up, there would be some kind of behavior you're gonna see, okay? And so in this graph, this shows that uh, what's the number of components we get as a function of the number of insertions. And as you can see, the models we talked about, the Barbasi Alberts, the preferential placement, these other things tend to behave quite differently, okay? The Barbasi Albert model very, very quickly uh, connects the graph because the smallest edges are going you know, from little important nodes, they probably connect them basically as a star to the important nodes, okay? So what do the experimental embeddings look like, okay? Well, for word embeddings, we find that, um, again, the, uh, they, they, they seem to kind of sit, when we look at two different types of word embeddings, word to Beck and glove, they kind of seem to sit between, um, the Gaussian and the uh, preferential placement model. When we look at um, the Wikipedia graph, okay, again, it lies between the Gaussian and the preferential placement model, okay? Um, when we look at the, uh, what do you call it, the gravitational attraction model, it looks like these things generate things that are also kind of between, okay, the, uh, 
preferential placement and the Gaussian, although more closer to the preferential placement thing. So bottom line, if we're trying to think, do I have a generative model that does these things yet? The answer is no. But the gravitational attraction model seems to be the one so far that kind of explains some of the things that we see. Okay, uh, to wrap this up quickly. Um, again, I've talked a lot about uh, various work we've done on embeddings. If I think of problems that we're, we're still working on that we kind of would like, you know, find interesting. Um, again, word embeddings, it's interesting. Gra the need for gra graph embedding, making graph embedding fast is turns out to be obvious. There's huge graphs and uh, stuff like that. The, the idea of making word embedding fast doesn't seem to have come up. And, you know, I guess it's because language doesn't change very much in languages, but somehow in my heart of heart, I imagine that there is an application or a world where you have large vocabularies of symbol that change meaning relatively rapidly, okay? And that uh, sequences of these symbols you're being fed and, you know, and there, there may be a need to reconstruct why one of these things happened. So I'm kind of curious if there's a fast way of that. I am interested in, again, finding are there better ways and faster ways to embed large graphs? Um, I'm interested in better, you know, sent faster and sent more sensitive dynamic graph embedding. So we'd like to be able to tell from looking at the neighborhood that's when is it that somebody really changes and have something bells go off. You're analyzing Wikipedia as it comes in. When is it that something has changed in a mean interesting way? Um, and finally, I'm interested in these generative uh, uh, embedding models and whether they provide any insight into uh, knowledge generation or anything like that. And with that, I am going to stop and thank you for, for listening. Uh, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? I had a quick question. So what was the, um, I, I must have missed it. What was the rationale for uh, gravitational um, uh, um, model giving rise to a good generative model? I didn't quite catch that. Why should they expect that that, would, that should give us a good generative model? Well, I'm trying to understand why is it that Wikipedia, const, why, why is it some model, let's just say, as mm -hmm. to why, you know, concepts form, okay? So why is it, again, you are, you know, if I'm thinking of you as an entity in the world, okay, what might be a model for how you form? I don't know what your training is, if it's in math or economics or physics, but it would not be shocking if you kind of fell into the orbit of some ad ad advisor who found, got you interested in something, okay? And you started basically orbiting this person and that's kind of, and of course your powers increase and you become an important person. But it could be that, that, that there are processes like this that maybe, you know, there's thing, the, the way that the, the reason why language or the reason why concepts are, emerge is that they kind of float and find their right space, okay? And that I think is kind of captured by a gravitational attraction type model, okay, at least vaguely. I see. But, Steve, could you say just again, very briefly for Wikipedia, what, what produces the graph? Is it the graph is primary for you or is it the embedding? And no, so the input is, the original input is the um, adjacency graph, okay? So you oh, look the at actual, how- The actual explicit links in Wikipedia? Ex or, explicit links between, okay. so for every entity whose web page, what does it link to? And we and make right, it an undirected. And that is how often something is linked to, or this frequency of. Link. And so its mass would be, yeah, the degree of it. Okay. okay? So that's quite possibly it. Uh -huh. Or we may have used some, some, and uh, there's some other measures of mass you might use that uh, are analogous to it, to yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. But I will, I'll claim that there, that the degree or the page rank or or something like this a per, or, or basically captures this kind of notion of significance. Uh -huh. Okay, so I, I think that was your question. Yeah, yeah.
So, uh, and, and then, and then your, your, your simplest observation is that uh, popular nodes do tend to cluster and be linked. Popular to nodes tend to cluster, yeah. okay? Um, to ways that, that don't seem to show up in some of these other generative models. That's kind of maybe the thing that's kind of interesting here. And the question of, can you, so, and gravity, you know, my original- And gravity for you was roughly, it's a product of the degrees of the two nodes that controls the- Presumably, I mean, again, we, we sort of uh, we stuck it in a, an end body simulation and we said that, uh, you know, the mass was presumably proportional to the degree. Okay, or By some body simulation, are things moving in ground in some space or what, what does that yeah, mean? So these things would move and you wait for a while and then you see where things are. Awesome. Okay, but, um, you know, but again, you know, you would expect that, again, these things change over time. Okay, yeah. and so, in a, you know, as a process. So, so, there, so I guess, like I said, the question that I'm kind of interested in is, is it that, um, you know, what is a, a process that, that would kind of, again, generate why there are things that people find interesting, okay? And that captures kind of, you know, there's certain areas in the world where there's, there's lots of topics and things about and certain areas where there aren't, okay? And, you know, the question is, can we reproduce behavior something like that from some kind of a generative model? Okay, and the hope that that might explain something about the evolution of how did, you know, how did the world that Wikipedia was based on get get to where it was? I mean, another hypothesis, and this, this could be obviously a very long discussion, would be that there, there is some much larger graph, but the fact that things get put into Wikipedia has to do with their importance. And then part of the perception of importance is that it is, in fact, related to something that one thinks is important. All right, so, so it could be as much the process that selects from a larger graph, which things actually get realized in Wikipedia. So there are, okay, so obviously there, there are other things that don't make Wikipedia and most things in the world don't make Wikipedia. Yeah. But, uh, but it, again, I think generally Wikipedia is pretty good. And so if you ask me, is Wikipedia sampling a representative selection of the most important of these things? The things that people find interesting, I suspect that it actually does a pretty good job. Oh, I, I, I quite agree, but then your your, your question was about uh, importance, right? I mean, which, uh, you know, so, so from that point of view, the selection is not uh, random. The selection is directly related to what you're measuring. Well, I would say, I would say that it, you're, you're right that it's pruning thing, but I would still say the relative importance of things in Wikipedia which is really what we're trying to get. I suspect is still pretty accurately captured. We agree that there's a uniform, uh, uni you know, a, a universe. Uh, in, in itself, that's a question somebody could study because we have, uh, we, we have access to a much larger corpuses of text, which are much less uh, selective. So I suppose somebody could study just that question. But, uh, no, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see. I mean, a, a question that, I mean, you, 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 you spoke largely about uh, undirected graphs with one type of uh, edge. And, and so there are structures where there's multiple types of edges, there's directed graphs, there's uh, labelings of different types. Did there's you... directed graphs, which the embedding world seems to have, um, you know, tend, tends not to worry very much about directed graphs for some reason, okay? This is at least, you know, and generally when you look at these things, okay, generally people take undirected graphs and direct them. And they take, take directed graphs and remove yeah, the- Yeah, okay, no, that, that, that point we can, we can talk about it much more length uh, a, little, a little later. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And, you know, and, and it's surprising, you know, in some sense it's surprising to me that this is what has become you know, and I, and I seem to remember from time to time we've done experiments where we tried to look at something like deep walk should be able to work perfectly well with a directed graph. Yeah. Um, and when we do it, it doesn't seem things change very much. So maybe that's why, but you know, but again, the, the, the question of labeled, edge labeled and vertex labeled graphs, and can you learn, you know, where, where, where you know, the, the late relations come from certain types Okay, that's a different beast, and uh, you know, and you know, and you know, 
again, I know that it comes in up in the knowledge graphs, which is one of the things you're interested in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, more questions from the audience? Uh, if not, uh, well, that's uh, thanks, Dave, again, for a very uh, broad ranging and uh, clear and informative talk. And uh, great. Okay, so I'll, I'll turn off the recording.